I was brought up by family vloggers and it ruined my life. That's the title of a viral Reddit post by an unnamed 17 year old girl who claimed to be part of a family channel that a few years ago had amassed over 500,000 subscribers. As the first generation of family channel children reach adulthood, it's fair to say that the past few years have not been kind to the genre. There have been several viral posts such as that, there have been infamous incidents that have led to children being taken away from their parents, and there have been multi-million dollar lawsuits aimed at adults that have forced children into a line of work that they never asked for. In this video, we're going over some of the most noteworthy and unique family channel cases, many of which you might have never heard of. For as much as something like Daddy05 fits into the themes of this video, it's been spoken about to death now, I really don't want to pile on and say the exact same things as everyone else, I want to give you guys something new. To do that, we need to begin with some background to the genre before we talk about its slow but sure corruption and commercialization. To start off with, you might be surprised to hear that the genre hasn't always been the exploitative, abusive and superficial niche of videos that we know it as today, it actually has much more humble backgrounds, that of course being the family home video. For as long as cameras have been accessible to the general public, we've been taking videos of our friends and family. It makes sense to do it and it's generally harmless. To get a bit morbid for a second, your parents or grandparents will likely die before you, so to keep hold of a time capsule of moments together, a memento of the laughs you shared and times you enjoyed is actually quite beautiful. On the flip side, your children, if you're lucky, will one day grow up, they won't be babies forever, and so to have videos of them growing up to cherish for the rest of your life is utterly amazing. Film cameras over the years have evolved to the point now in which we have them in our back pockets for 24 hours of the day, and so it makes sense that people would take their home videos and then upload them to the internet. The family channel genre, the best I could find, can be traced back to videos uploaded in the late 2000s. I think that the best example of this evolution is the Shaytards, whose tagline is If life's worth living, then it's worth recording. That is a very family channel perspective if you ask me. Now, the Shaytards are not the most egregious family channel out there, at least not in the modern day. Their videos currently seem like a bit of a shared vlog account. However, a few years ago for sure, you could have easily described them as a family channel, but if you go back even further, you'll see that they were established in 2008, and their videos from 14 or 15 years ago are in fact these very pure, very natural family vlogs, not really intending to be seen by hundreds and thousands of people. Innocently at first, these people were just sharing their family experiences for the whole world to see, and audiences were eating it up. Whether it be child viewers who can relate to the children of these videos, or whether it be adults who just want to share in the joys of parenthood, these videos have pure origins. However, with larger audiences came the ability to monetize your videos. From there, family activities could become more outlandish. The more your channel grew, the more your family could, first of all, make massive amounts of money, and secondly, go on crazier and crazier adventures. Now there was an incentive to record and share your family's most intimate moments. It seemed as though the more you shared, the more you let your audience into this one-way relationship, the more views you would get. It's also helped that in the early 2010s, YouTube's algorithm favoured creators who were able to get viewers coming back each and every day. That's what led to the rise of genres such as the Let's Play, but also the Daily Vlog, perhaps the most invasive sector of the family channel niche. Over the next few years, the genre would become more established, and by the mid-2010s, it was really in full swing. Keep in mind that some of these children from the Shaytards are now fully grown adults. Their oldest son is 19 and their oldest daughter is 18 as of the time of me writing this. The long term effects of having a camera shoved in their face for the past 14 years is now only going to start to be seen. This applies to any family channel kid who's reaching maturity by the way, not just the Shaytards. These channels are a different beast entirely to the child actors on Nickelodeon and Disney for example, because while few of these children are perhaps as famous as those TV kids, child actors in Hollywood at the very least don't usually have their daily lives documented from the time they're four. I mean, can you imagine trying to navigate teenagehood with a vlog camera shoved in your face? Worse yet, if there was a major controversy in your family it leaked all over the internet to the entire web, leading to millions of people knowing the most private, intimate details of your family's lowest points. Legitimately, for a young person to grow up with the eyes of the internet on you, for you to know that everyone at school might know the darkest secrets of your family, they might know all the skeletons in their closet, I mean, it might not be for some people, but I would be traumatised by that. 
keep in mind that for these children, this is at no fault of their own, it's just the environment that they grew up in forced on them by their parents. And that leads us into our next topic. If you're watching this video, it's very likely that you have a family of some sort. If you don't, I'm incredibly sorry, but nonetheless, everyone should know that families are incredibly messy. To put on my cliche film student video essay cap for a moment, I think that one of the reasons that The Simpsons was such a huge hit in the 90s is that it took the stereotypical family sitcom and flipped it on its head, holding up a mirror to society. For as much as 80s sitcoms portrayed families as having strong cause foundationally, but the characters got up to some zany wacky antics, something like The Simpsons was telling us that families are dysfunctional, they're chaotic, and it's something that people can relate to. During my research for this video, I found a Medium article written by Gillian Sisley, and she wrote something that particularly stood out to me. She said, Narcissism disguised as the perfect family. It's important to keep in mind, these channels aren't unfiltered. These parents are showing you exactly what they want you to see. And as for the parts that aren't favourable, well, they just edit that out. I think that part of the appeal of family channels is that they're meant to be pure and innocent, reminiscent of 80s sitcoms in which they get up to some zany wacky antics and foolish hijinks, but at the end of the day, the family have strong emotional bonds that can never be broken. Unless, you know, one of them cheats on the other, just like in the aforementioned case of Shay Carl, or in the case of the Shaytard's family friends, the Knife Knolls, a now divorced interracial husband-wife duo with three kids. In this case, the husband Austin was unfaithful to his wife Brittany, with this being confirmed by her to be the reason that the two divorced in a vlog from early 2018. Another instance of this could be the Christian family channel Sam and Nia, after it was reported that the husband Sam had accessed Ashley Madison, an online dating service for people to have affairs, described as a business built on the back of broken hearts. Of course, this false reality of the perfect family isn't exclusive to adultery, because it can sometimes come in the form of literal abuse towards the children. As I said at the start of this video, I won't be going into a full-on explanation of Daddy05, but to grossly oversimplify, these family vlogs were actually deemed to be abusive to two of the children in particular, so much so that they were actually taken away from their father and stepmother. A similar story also happened with a channel called Eight Passengers after they were accused of abuse because they made their 15 year old son sleep on beanbags for seven months. A lot of people found the parents of the Eight Passengers channel to be way too severe and started to question their methods. They eventually stopped uploading at the very start of 2022. We could even take the Reddit post as potential evidence if it is in fact written by a former family channel child. My point is that just like a lot of content online, this content is not real. The families, at least the way they portray themselves, are not real. They are a projection of what the perfect family would look like because that's what their subscribers want to see. I want to clarify that none of the points that I'm making here should be interpreted as an attack. As I mentioned earlier, these cases have been covered to death and I don't really want to dogpile on, but they're still very relevant. At the end of the day, these are real families with real people in them, even if what they're showing you is fake. And it's only when you dig a bit deeper, however, that you realise that what was on the surface this nice, fun, wholesome activity is actually a bit chilling when you think about it. We've become accustomed to family channels on the internet. They're a popular genre, or at the very least they were at a point in time. I think that we've all seen family channels in the past and scoffed at them for using their children for clicks, but have you ever taken a moment out of your day to pause and actually think about that? Like genuinely think about it? I think that it's time for this video to address what this actually is in some cases. At the end of the day, being a YouTuber is a job to some of these kids. They have consistent upload schedules and they are the key ingredient in a money-making business, some of which are worth millions of dollars, and to top it all off, they never really had a choice. Let's get it straight, this is some next level Truman Show stuff. Some of these children have been on camera since before they were born, and a five-year-old who's been raised in this environment won't really understand it until they're older because they just can't. For them, being on camera is just a part of life. They have no concept of whether it's right or wrong, and even if they did, even if they did, what are they gonna do? Go up to their parents and say, uh, sorry mother, I think not. It's not gonna happen, they wouldn't be listened to. Obviously, usually children working is illegal, but in the case of family channels, it's not exactly. There's a lot of legal grey areas and loopholes to be exploited, and since this is a recent phenomena, it's only natural that the law hasn't been able to keep up. 
You could make the argument that the way that some of their parents treat them is kind of reminiscent of child actors who have been forced into the industry by their parents. I made the comparison earlier, so I want to delve a little bit more into it, but at least with child actors in the USA, they have Coogan accounts that in theory should protect the money that they make from their parents. I mean, not in the case of Jeanette McCurdy, but the point is that there have been some legislation put in place in some areas of the world that try to protect young people from parents who might not have the best intentions. The internet, unfortunately, doesn't have anything like this. And it wasn't until April of 2022 that it seems as if anyone actually cared to do anything about it, as it was then that a 17-year-old Seattle native Girl Scout named Chris McCarthy wrote to local lawmakers to try and protect children from being exploited for cash in family vlogs. Apparently, McCarthy spent months researching into the concept of child influencers and was both fascinated and simultaneously appalled at the lack of regulation around child labour online. This phenomena has been reported on by several news outlets, but it's not really something I've seen discussed here on YouTube. According to a Guardian article I found during research for this video, they had even coined the phrase kidfluencer to refer to a child who is also an influencer. That article, by the way, came out back in 2019, so it's four years old now. This isn't exactly new. But still, over the past four years, even if the family channel genre has kind of died out, children being the faces of multi-million dollar companies has not. In research for this video, I read a portion of Carolina Corello's study on family channels titled YouTube Family Vlogging as a Promoter of Digital Child Labor, a Case Study on the Bucketless Family. As the title suggests, in this study, she looks at a YouTube channel called The Bucketless Family. They have 1.44 million subscribers, and they've been on YouTube for about eight years now. She found that 48%, so essentially half of their videos, refer to their children's ages in the titles, whether it be five-year-old or baby or kid. This is to say that the focus of these videos, the reason that people are clicking on them, is because these children are the stars. They're the draw-in, they are the unique selling point, they are the money makers. And this feature is even more blatantly obvious when you look at the Bucketless family's videos that have performed the best. Almost all of them feature these buzzwords alongside the children put into some sort of dramatised peril, often to do with deep sea swimming. Speaking of which, Corello also makes a bit of an observation within her study that it's clear that within their most popular video, the kids are put into a diving cage that is clearly not meant for them, as they need to wear weighted belts around their waist to keep them submerged, and the gear is clearly not fit for humans their size. The study then goes on to discuss the revenue generated by the video itself. For reference, their most popular video has 19 million views, it's almost 25 minutes long, with 5 ad breaks, and potentially has a paid partnership and a sponsor that was played with by the kids themselves. And that links us up well to the point that I made at the start of this segment, which is that these children are being used to advertise a brand. Did they ever sign a contract for this? I mean, I can't be certain, but I would assume not. Are they ever going to see the money that they generated through the sponsorship? I mean, it's very possible that they will, but since there's no legislation put in place that would guarantee it, I mean, it's very possible that they also won't. The way things are right now, whether it be for the Bucketless family or for any other family channel on the internet, even if the children are the driving force behind the views, the parents are going to be the one to make everything, and all it costs is the rights of privacy of their children, again, signed on by the parents. And the parents of these channels are the only ones who are guaranteed to make any money out of it, because at the end of the day, it's their name behind the YouTube channel, it's their accounts that the money would be deposited into, the children are not guaranteed anything because there's no contracts, there's no legislation, there are no clauses. And even if there were, a five-year-old cannot sign a legally binding contract. Fortunately though, over the next few years, it does seem as though things are going to start to look a little bit better. Going back to an earlier point, Chris McCarthy was able to team up with a Washington state representative, Emily Wicks, to draft up a bill to try and protect these kids. According to the TechCrunch article that reported on the incident, if the content reached a certain monetary threshold and has an individual minor featured over 30% of the time, in that case, a percentage of the family vlog's income would be set aside in a trust to be given to the child when they turn into an adult. When that happens, the individual could then also request that the content that they appeared in be removed from the internet. There have also been British members of parliament who have sought to address this issue, as kidfluencers also seem to be very popular over here. To me, that just makes common sense, because while I'm not accusing the Bucketless family, nor am I accusing any other YouTube family channel of doing anything, I'd also wager that there are a small handful of these channels that might not have the best intentions at heart. Corello concludes her study by mentioning that the top five videos on the Bucketless family channel have 40 million views combined. 
They all use the children as unique selling points for the videos and they're all fully monetized. I can't come to any other conclusion myself other than these children are working. The final line of the essay concludes, Perhaps by acknowledging that these children are workers for their family's businesses, society becomes more aware of the need to protect them. A statement that I completely agree with and a fitting ending to this segment of the video. Moving on, I'm putting up a content warning here because you might even think that all of these stories that I've covered today seem minuscule compared to what we're about to talk about. It's interesting because for as much media coverage as Daddy 5 received or Fantastic Adventures, nowhere near as much has been said about a family channel that perhaps could be considered worse if the allegations against it are true. Let's talk about the Piper Raquel lawsuit. Now this is important, I need to preface this segment of the video by saying that these allegations are merely that, they are allegations. They have not been proven true in a court of law in the slightest. Not yet, at least. But a short while ago now, news stories broke about a lawsuit being levied against the mother of a very popular creator, Piper Raquel. If you've never seen the channel before, it is incredibly successful, having more than 600 videos, more than 11 million subscribers, and almost 3 billion views. But it's possible that this all came at a price for the teenagers involved in getting it where it is today. Like seriously, some of the things that Piper Raquel's mother is said to have done are so over the line I literally cannot mention them here. However, I will try and mention as much as I can in a respectful manner. So some background is that Piper Raquel a few years back formed a squad to appear in her videos. It's nothing new or anything, creators banding together to make content has been done before and it will be done again. What separates this group of creators from many others, however, was that many of these members since forming the squad have come out to accuse Raquel's mother Tiffany Smith of all sorts of abuse, ranging from verbal to emotional to physical and even sexual. In total, 11 minors came out to file a lawsuit worth $22 million, with these people ranging in age from 16 to just 10 years old. For that reason, I think you can understand a little bit better why I don't really want to get into any specific details here. Not only would it land this video on a one-way ticket to Demonetization City, but also I just think mentally it wouldn't be good for me to have to write down, then record, then edit all of these things that Tiffany Smith is said to have done. An article by The Independent detailing the lawsuit from back in April of this year stated, In the lawsuit, the plaintiffs claim they weren't compensated for the use of their names, images and likenesses in Raquel's content. The 147-page complaint also names Smith's boyfriend, Hunter Hill, as the primary director and editor of Raquel's content. The 11 teenagers are each asking for roughly $2 million in damages from Smith and Hill, totaling at least $22 million. But fascinatingly, after the lawsuit was announced in January 2022, Tiffany Smith would later counter sue in July, seeking $30 million in damages, saying that this was a plot to try and extort her. However, Smith would later drop the case, with her opposition's representatives calling the countersuit baseless. It doesn't stop there for Smith though, because this lawsuit seems to only be the tip of the iceberg. If you look into the past of Piper Raquel's content, you'll see that these sorts of allegations and controversies have plagued it for years. For example, in 2021, YouTube took down three video thumbnails for violating its child safety policy. And this incident would then attract the attention of Pink, the famous singer-songwriter. Pink took to Twitter to throw shade at Tiffany Smith for exploiting her daughter, to which Smith responded by saying that these pictures are only weird if you interpret them as such. But even before this incident, Tiffany Smith had been accused of the worst. Back in 2020, NBC Los Angeles reported on a story in which there was an Instagram account made called Exposing Raquel, which accused Smith of being involved in CP. This was also something that the January 2022 lawsuit accused her of, which went on to allege that she once described herself as the pimp of YouTube. Now, I should clarify that this Instagram account isn't exactly reliable. Firstly, it leaked the address of Raquel and her mother, which is incredibly dangerous and creepy. Additionally, to the best of my knowledge, the person or people behind the account were never named, so it's possible that they just didn't know the family in the first place. Nonetheless, I thought that it should be brought up because there is a small chance that whoever was behind this account did actually know something. In regards to Piper Raquel's channel, in the wake of the lawsuit, it has been fully demonetized, but this isn't the end of the world for it as Piper is still incredibly famous and is even going on tour right now as we speak. In fact, since the lawsuit began, I'd argue that she's at the very least maintained her popularity, if not actually increased it. 
There was a huge dip for a few months after the suit was announced, but in terms of both views and subscribers, May 2023 was her best month in the past three years. This might all change in November though, because if Tiffany Smith is found guilty of abusing these 11 minors, it would be a complete joke to keep the channel up if Tiffany Smith has anything to do with it. In my opinion, if Tiffany Smith is in fact found guilty of abusing these 11 minors, YouTube have to stay consistent. Piper Raquel's channel has to go. So I guess all we have to do now is just wait and find out. I'm sorry to leave things on such a bummer note, but that's all we have time for today. If you enjoyed this video, why not check out my one on the darkest depths of YouTube kids? It shares a lot of the same themes as this video, so if you love this, I'm sure you'll love it too. Speaking of which, if you love this, why not like and subscribe? I am unbearably close to 100,000 subscribers. It would mean so much to me. Please just hit that big red button. It would mean the world. Aside from that, I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you later.